So, far we have seen that the input output subsystem consists of uh, peripheral devices along with their controllers which are connected to uh, rest of the system through buses. So, buses form typically the medium of uh, communication between peripherals, processor and memory. Uh, last time we saw that there are different types of buses and uh, performance of the buses in terms of their throughput or bandwidth was an important issue. We will continue on that discussion, uh, talk about performance, we will begin with the example which we uh, <coughs> covered at the end of the last lecture, we will uh, repeat that and uh, talk about uh, issue of bus arbitration when there are multiple devices which need to communicate on the same bus. Uh, we will take specific example of how buses are organized in a modern PC system and we will also look at some standard buses as, as an example. <coughs> so, we uh, while talking of uh, performance of the bus, we notice that there are several factors which uh, can be uh, exploited to increase the performance of the bus. So, uh, something which is very obvious is the width of the bus that means, how many bits or bytes it can carry at any time. So, so there are uh, buses on one extreme which are serial buses that means, one bit of data uh, is carried at any given time. Then there are 8 bit buses, 16 bit buses, 32 bit buses, 64 and even higher. <coughs> so, uh, the, the rate at which data moves or the throughput is directly proportional to width of the bus which is very obvious. Then uh, different things on a bus may be multiplexed. For, for example, <coughs> typically address and data lines are multiplexed. That means, at any given point of time, either address is being communicated on the bus or data is being communicated. So, uh, if you can uh, provide separate lines, which means additional cost of the bus, then there is an improvement in performance. We also looked at two different types of protocol, synchronous and asynchronous. Synchronous protocol implies that uh, everything is controlled by a clock. So, all events occur uh, at active edge of clock and all times are measured in terms of clock cycles. Whereas, in asynchronous bus, uh, th there is uh, interlocked response uh, to each other's request from uh, the device and uh, the other party which could be memory or processor. So, uh, one event occurs. Uh, which triggers another event, that triggers another event and so on. So, the events get chained or interlocked one after another. Now, because of uh, the need to uh, allow arbitrary amount of time uh, from one event to other event, these protocols tend to be slower. They are flexible in the sense that uh, slow and fast devices can be mixed on the same bus, uh, but the throughput is comparatively lower as compared to synchronous bus, where you do not have to sense signals going up or down, you need to wait for a fixed amount of time and assume that something would have happened. So, the, the higher speed buses typically follow a synchronous approach. We uh, in the last example in the previous lecture, we were seeing the effect of uh, the block size. I, if you uh, are able to transfer larger blocks, chunks of larger blocks then uh, the overall throughput is faster. We will uh, go through that once again. And finally, uh, if you can make use of the bus uh, in the idle period, uh, typically uh, the, the bus is occupied when you are starting a transaction, then it is unoccupied and then it is required again when you are closing it. So, in between there is a unutilized period and we can use it to interleave transactions or initiate other transactions that is called a split transaction protocol. So, that is another device, another mechanism to improve the bus throughput. So, let us get back to uh, that example of uh, block size and its effect on uh, bus performance. Uh, just for your recollection, here is the asynchronous handshaking protocol, one example we had seen and a synchronous protocol. <coughs> So, uh, we are talking of uh, a bus which is a 64 bit synchronous bus <coughs> and frequency is 200 megahertz. 
and we will see effect of uh, varying the block size from 4 to 16. So, now the protocol of the bus is as follows that it takes one clock cycle to send either data or address and we require two clock cycle between uh, each bus operation. So, so, these are the characteristics of the bus and memory which is being accessed is capable of uh, sending first four words uh, at uh, within 200 nanoseconds and then each additional word uh, requires 20 nanoseconds. So, so it has uh, a mechanism within it that uh, you do not need to uh, repeat the whole transaction, it, it can actually get additional words within uh, 20 nanoseconds. Uh, we also assume that bus transfer and reading of next data overlap that means when uh, one data which is fetched from memory is being transferred on the bus the the memory is memory could be busy reading the next data okay so now our requirement is to transfer 256 words on the whole either in groups of four words or in groups of 16 words so here is uh, uh, the, the calculation for finding the latency that means how long it takes to transfer or the bandwidth that means the total uh, rate at which data gets transferred. So, we are considering two possibilities the block size <coughs> is either 4 words or 16 words. Okay. So, I am just denoting that by n the number of uh, transfers or transactions required for 256 words is 256 by n. So, uh, when you are transferring 4 words at a time, you require this to be done 64 times. When you are transferring 16 words at a time, you require this to be done 16 times okay, to make a total of 256 words. Now, the, the cycles each transaction takes uh, involves sending an address which takes 1 clock, then allowing memory to access the data which takes 40 clocks okay, because 200 nanosecond was the time given and 200 megahertz means 5 nanosecond is the clock period. So, 40 clock periods uh, the, the data uh, requires two, 2 clock cycle to be sent because memory is fetching 4 words at a time and the bus is 64 bit wide. Okay. Let us uh, get back to the specification uh, memory accesses 4 words at a time. Okay. Uh, first time it takes 200 nanoseconds and next time it takes 20 nanoseconds and the bus is 2 word wide. So, so it, it requires 2 cycles to send this data and uh, then uh, between uh, uh, one transfer of data and the next one the bus needs an idle time of 2 clock cycles. So, now it is uh, these figures which have been put here 1 plus 40 plus this 2 into 2 which will take care of uh, sending uh, 4 words. Okay. And uh, if n is larger then this part will be repeated. So, so in this case when the block size is 4 words only uh, th this happens only once when the block size is 16 this happens <coughs> 4 times. Okay, so, so, we are multiplying this part by n by 4 which is uh, the block size in n is the block size in words. So, it takes 45 word 45 cycles here and in this cycle in this time we have sent 4 words here it takes 57 cycles and we have sent 16 words in that time. So, the total number of cycles uh, is uh, this c cycles per transaction multiplied by m which is the number of transactions to make up 256 words. So, 45 <coughs> multiplied by 64 product of these two numbers is the total number of cycles product of those these two numbers is the total number of cycles here. Okay. So, now this is in terms of cycles we can uh, convert this into nanoseconds by multiplying it with 5 nanoseconds. Okay. So, uh, the total latency is this multiplied by 5 so many nanoseconds 
or 912 multiplied by 5 4560 nanoseconds. So, th this is the total time required to transfer 256 to read 256 words from the memory. Uh, we can also talk of transaction rate, how many transactions are being done per second. Okay. A transaction means different thing here, transaction here means sending 4 words, transaction here means sending 16 words. So, number of transaction in million transactions per second is uh, 1000 times m the number of transactions over the time it takes. Okay. So, it is uh, 4.44 million transactions per second and 3.51 million transactions per second here. The bandwidth is the total number of bytes being transferred per second. Okay. Bandwidth or throughput is uh, uh, let us say measured in megabytes per second. So, we have 256 words multiplied by 4 which means which gives you bytes. So, many bytes in time t gives you the throughput. So, 71.1 megabytes per second is the throughput here and 224.6 is the megabytes per second is the throughput there. So, so th there is a uh, marked difference in terms of the uh, throughput of these two buses. Uh, the other thing we talked of was split transaction. So, if you look along the time axis, so suppose one transaction uh, begins here, okay, for example, sending the address all right, and sending a request to the memory that you want to read and then uh, memory takes some time. So, in between uh, the, the device which had sent this request is not using the bus. So, bus could be released and made available to somebody else and when memory signals that the data is ready or uh, if it is synchronous you wait for right number of cycles and then you can come back on the bus and read the data. Now, in between you can allow another transaction to begin which might end later on. Okay. So, so now uh, you, you have to properly link the beginnings and the ends. So, so that means the device which send a request here uh, should know exactly when it has to uh, pick up the data it requested and similarly the one which requested here needs to pick up at appropriate time. Okay. Uh, so, but, but uh, as it is very obvious that utilization of the bus is much better here. Okay. Now, uh, we have assumed that you can have uh, many uh, parties connected to a single bus. Okay. They could be processor, memory, I O devices all could be in general sitting on a single bus. So, uh, there are many conversations or many transactions between different pairs which can go on. Uh, so, we have typically a concept of master and slave on the bus. Master is the one which initiates a transaction. Okay. So, it will initiate a request for read or write and slave is the one which will respond to this request. So, so typically uh, let us say let us imagine three different situations processor talking to memory. So, processor wants to uh, get a block of data containing instructions. Okay or uh, wants to write a block of data to the memory. So, in, in this uh, conversation processor would be the master and memory would be the slave. Another scenario is that uh, a disk drive wants to uh, write into memory or read from memory. So, in this case the disk drive controller would be the master, memory would be the slave. Uh, there could be another scenario that processor wants to initiate a transfer. So, processor wants to instruct the disk drive that uh, from track number so and so, uh, set number so and so send 1000 bytes of data to memory. Okay. So, that, that is the uh, initiation process and their processor would be the master and the peripheral controller would be the slave. So, so uh, among masters I have listed processors or peripherals and slaves peripheral of the memory. So, peripherals could be uh, slaves while talking to processor would be master while talking to memory uh, and processors are always masters, memories are always slaves. Okay. Now, uh, with possibility of multiple masters on a bus, uh, how do we coordinate among them? Okay. What happens if uh, uh, multiple masters have a need to 
transact on the bus simultaneously. So, what is the discipline which has to be followed? Uh, so, so it it's a it's an issue of getting access to the bus or getting control of the bus and using it and then releasing it. Okay, so so uh, after bus has been released by one master, another master can use it. Uh, th there has to be typically an arrangement of priorities. So uh, somebody may have higher priority, somebody may have <coughs> lower priority, and uh, this priority could be used to resolve the conflict when multiple requests are there simultaneously one with higher priority needs to be given and these priorities uh, would depend upon uh, what, what is urgency. So, uh, there may be some transaction which cannot wait which have to be done on a urgent basis. At the same time fairness is essential uh, whether uh, a particular party has low priority or high priority it should eventually get its chance. So, the, the usage should be uh, reasonably distributed and everyone should get chance. We will look at uh, uh, four different mechanisms called daisy chaining, centralized parallel arbitration, distributed arbitration and arbitration by collision detection. So, so which are used uh, different mechanisms are used in different buses and we will see how these work. Uh, so, here is a scenario showing uh, the first approach called daisy chain for uh, resolving the uh, access issue to the bus. So, here we assume that there are multiple devices. Uh, I am using the term device here in a generic sense, one of these could be processor. Okay. So, so these are all potential masters who wants to access the bus. Uh, we are not showing the bus completely, bus will have data lines and address lines and so on, we are not showing those. We are only showing a few signals which uh, will define the discipline of transfer of control of bus from one master to other master. We assume that there is uh, a block here called bus arbiter uh, which will actually coordinate the whole thing. So, uh, the devices are arranged in uh, a decreasing order of priority, highest priority is sitting close closest to the arbiter and the one with lowest priority sits farthest away from the arbiter. There are uh, bus request signals and bus release signals. So, so this is a, there is a common signal on which every device can send a request and there is another signal on which bus a, a device which had the bus can sh can indicate that it does not need the bus any longer. Then uh, the interesting part here is that uh, the, a bus grant signal which comes from the arbiter is chained through all devices in a uh, in a manner which is called daisy chain. So, grant signal goes to device 1 which is the highest priority device, it may use it or it may pass it on to the next one which may block it or pass it on to the next one and so on. So, uh, let us say a request comes from some device say device number 2 in response to that the arbiter will send a grant signal okay. and uh, device 1 does not need it. So, it will allow the signal to pass through to device 2, device 2 needs this. So, it will block it and uh, all the devices further down will not see a grant signal. Okay. So, so it is same signal uh, which is trying to propagate through from one end to other end and at some point it gets blocked. If there are multiple devices requesting for the bus the one which is closest to the arbiter will block it first and the one which is uh, uh, downstream will not be able to see it. So, so that, that is how priorities are managed. So, the exact sequence of events which will go on is as follows. The device one of one or more devices they will send a request okay, and request is sent by uh, let us say raising this line bus request line to 1, uh, one could have an opposite convention, but uh, just for the sake of explanation I am assuming that uh, the request line is normally 0 and it will go to 1 indicating that some device is requesting. In response to this uh, if the bus is free the arbiter will activate the grant signal and uh, assuming that the, the device which needs the bus gets the signal 
it will then lower the request okay and then start using the bus right so it will use the bus for certain interval of time and then activate release signal so i am assuming that release signal was also zero initially and now it has become one right uh, when the bus arbiter sees that uh, bus has been released it will lower the grant signal okay and in response to that the device will also lower its release signal so so this is a, a, a complete transaction of getting acquiring the bus and releasing the bus now let's try to understand what will happen if there are multiple devices which are requesting the bus so uh, at any point of time let us say bus was free and the bus arbiter notices that there is a request for the bus now uh, you can imagine that imagine that this uh, both these signals release and request are wired or in the sense that uh, each device may send its individual request but effectively what you see on the bus what you see on this line is or of all those okay so a one here means that uh, one or more devices are requesting for the bus you don't know which one all you know is that there is at least one device which is requesting for the bus <coughs> bus arbiter doesn't worry about who is requesting and it simply uh, activates the grant line indicating that yes uh, among all of you which one ha whosoever has the highest priority can now use the bus okay so uh, naturally the device which is lower down in the chain will wait the one which is higher up in the chain will get the bus uh, when the high priority device completes the cycle okay it will uh, it would have lower down its own request but but uh, this line will stay high because uh, there is a lower priority device which is still persisting right and uh, uh, eventually when the bus grant has been lower down release has been lower down uh, the bus arbiter will still see that there is a request right and it will uh, give the grant once again which will be uh, now seen by a lower priority device so uh, eventually uh, if multiple devices had requested for the bus uh, simultaneously or in overlapping manner then they will get the bus grant one by one uh, one device gets served then uh, when it is through another device in the chain will get served then next device will get served and so on uh, what would happen if uh, a, a device is getting served and a higher priority device comes up with a request now so uh, if a higher priority device comes uh, it will find that grant signal is one okay and it might think that uh, the grant has been made one for uh, his own request but but that could be a, a disastrous situation because uh, uh, the high priority device will hijack away the bus uh, while a lower priority device was still using it to avoid that uh, we, we follow a rule that uh, uh, the, the device has to look at a transition on the grant signal it should not just assume that a one level on the grant signal is sufficient to ensure that it has the bus granted it has to see the grant signal going from 0 to 1 so, so now with, with this assumption if you have a high priority device coming in between when bus was already being used by a low priority device uh, it will find grant signal 1 but it will not see a transition 0 to 1 on the bus on the on the on the bus grant and therefore the situation which i mentioned will get avoided okay so i i have already mentioned rising edge on the grant signal is significant and not the level Th there is another point here uh, one may question that why do we need a release signal why not we simply manage with a grant signal and a request signal uh, if you if you do not have a release signal then the bus arbiter will not have a clear indication of when the trans when the usage of bus is over because uh, a device which is using the bus would have removed its request 
but since other requests are still persisting you won't know uh, this change so you you need another uh, signal to indicate that bus <coughs> is being released okay so so this is important uh, now this arrangement is uh, very simple and inexpensive okay the arbiter is very simple okay it doesn't have to worry about who has what priority it simply looks at the request and release and activates grant or deactivates grant signal uh, the the problem with this is that uh, the speed could be limited here if the chain is very long uh, if, if the chain is long as we have seen in carry propagation uh, there, there is a delay so uh, we have to allow for the maximum delay before we can actually uh, decide whether the signal has changed from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. So, if chain is long uh, the, the operation will get slowed down. <coughs> the, the other problem is that uh, uh, in this we have not ensured that a low priority device does not start. What could happen is that uh, suppose in this go back to previous diagram. Uh, it could happen that high priority device can keep on uh, shuttling the bus in between them and uh, a low priority device can always keep waiting right so su suppose uh, device 1 and 2 let's say 1 2 and n all had requested so one gets served then two gets its chance but before two finishes one has another request okay so as soon as uh, two releases grant is given again device 1 gets it Okay. and uh, meanwhile uh, request from 2 could come and so on. So, bus could keep uh, getting passed on between high priority devices and some devices at low priority end could get starved. So, the solution to that uh, could be as follows that a device that has just used the bus uh, can be uh, should be disallowed to require it until it sees the request line go low. Okay, the meaning of this is that uh, if, if you have used the bus uh, there may be other requests pending. So, so request line will continue to be 1 uh, till everyone down the line has served, has been served. Okay. The request line goes low only when uh, no device is requesting that means everyone who has requested at some point of time uh, is served. So, uh, a, a device if, if a device does not make a second request before everyone else who was in the queue has been served then this problem will go away. Okay, the second solution which I mentioned about uh, arbitration is a centralized parallel arbitration. Uh, here we have again uh, many devices which can request and there is a central arbiter which can send grant. Now, we assume that there is a separate request line for each device and a separate grant line for each device. So, uh, this is the request line for device 1 and a grant line, request line for 2, grant line for 2, request line for n, grant line for n. Now, the, the whole logic is contained in this arbiter, arbiter uh, is supposed to look at all the requests and issue them grants individually. So, uh, then the, the priorities of the devices uh, could be hard coded into this arbiter or could be defined dynamically and th this could in a fair manner uh, assign the bus or give the grant signal to various devices uh, turn by turn all right. Uh, so, here uh, uh, the, the priority need not be defined by by the position the way we did earlier although in the picture i have shown this highest priority this is the lowest priority but but uh, the, the position where you are located uh, is not necessarily uh, the priority because there is no chaining here so so you can arbitrarily define priorities of various devices and uh, the the resolution of multiple requests will take place here so the kind of um, mechanism which is being followed in the previous case in somewhat a distributed manner would now get concentrated uh, in a single arbiter. So, arbiter here is more complex than uh, what we assumed in the previous case. Uh, we can distribute this task of arbitration among the devices themselves. So, uh, it is a 
more uh, democratic kind of system where all all the devices sort of negotiate among themselves or uh, uh, collectively decide who gets the bus so you you have uh, you have several control lines on which devices can send their requests and also uh, put their identity on the on some uh, specific lines so each each one can see who all are requesting at any given time and uh, the identities are all available so so let us say uh, device 2 sees that device 1 is requesting and device 5 is requesting and uh, then it if it understand that it among these three among 1 uh, 2 and 5 it is not the highest priority it it would stay back and allow the one which is highest priority among all these to go through so uh, the priorities of various devices are understood by each other and uh, in a in a honest manner all devices are supposed to look at what is going on on the bus what requests are there on the table and uh, make a choice accordingly uh then lastly we have arbitration by collision detection so the example of this is ethernet uh where you have similar to the previous case you have a shared medium over which all devices are connected and here uh you you notice each device simply sees that if the bus is free you try to uh, initiate a transaction and if multiple uh, devices happen to do so uh, then there there is a need to figure out that whether collision occurred or not okay so uh, what to do is you first check if the bus is free uh, then try to start and then check if uh, what you sent uh, was uh, uh, did collide with something else or not so if no collision takes place that means what you see on the bus is what you wrote okay uh, then that means there is no collision and it means you have the access to the bus and you can continue on the other hand if you if you uh, collide that means you try to write something but because somebody else also wrote something on the bus uh, what you saw was a combination which is different from what you wrote and that's an indication of collision so so you back off and uh, try again after some time uh, to ensure that uh, both devices which collided don't uh, try again at the same time this uh, delay is uh, modified randomly okay so uh, one device may try after 5 uh, microsecond other may try after 15 microseconds and therefore unlikely that they'll clash again for some reason if there is a clash again you just repeat the process so it's again very simple but obviously time gets lost in uh, because of collision so uh, if if the density of the traffic if if the usage requirement for the bus is not very heavy uh, the the collision will not be too many and therefore it will work efficiently so in the distributed arbitration yeah uh, won't the lower lowest priority devices again be starved uh yes it could get starved okay if if the requests keep on coming from uh, high priority devices and priorities are fixed uh and we we don't follow a rule of the kind i mentioned earlier uh then the starvation could occur so so you you could either have somewhat restrictive rules so that repeated uh, re request actually uh, get held back or you could also talk of uh, modifying the priorities dynamically the priorities could rotate okay so for example uh, a device which let's say use the bus uh, kind of goes back to the queue end of the queue and stand in the queue again so so that could be the lowest priority uh, and therefore the priorities could dynamically modify okay now we talked of different types of buses and uh, one scenario which i had shown where we had three types of buses uh, uh, i'm showing it again here you have a processor memory bus typically a proprietary bus connect processor memory and through an adapter you have a backplane bus hooked to it so backplane uh, bus is the one where io bus directly or indirectly and processor memory directly or indirectly all connect the io multiple io buses could be there connected through different adapters to the backplane bus so for example uh, one io bus could take care of uh, disk drives cd rom and so on other could take care of uh, uh, 
may be uh, printer scanners and so on. Uh, typ typically, uh, the I O buses are standard, processor memory buses are proprietary, backprint buses could be either, more often they are also more and more becoming uh, standard. Uh, the, the speeds obviously are highest at process memory bus level and lowest at I O bus level. Uh, the P M buses will tend to be synchronous, I O buses uh, would tend to be asynchronous, but uh, th there are examples of both kinds. Backplane buses are also now generally synchronous. Now, th this, this, is a, this is a kind of uh, uh, oversimplified situation. If you look at a real system, uh, thing may be somewhat different. So, I am showing an example of a typical uh, Pentium 4 uh, type of architecture, where you have uh, basically this is the processor and you have two uh, controllers or two hubs. Okay. Instead of uh, adapters, we have uh, these uh, device actually these two form what is uh, commonly called a chipset. Okay. So, uh, you, you have a chipset around which a motherboard is built, you have a processor and you have chipset uh, which interface uh, most of the other things and uh, th these actually characterize a particular motherboard. So, there are two uh, complex chips here, this is called uh, MCH or GMCH, MCH stands for memory control hub or GMCH graphics memory control hub, ICH is I O control hub. So, uh, uh, this is on this side it connects to memory modules, on this side it connects to the display modules, it could be a CRT monitor, LCD monitor or it could be simply a video out <coughs> and uh, this connects to a uh, variety of peripherals including uh, a P PCI bus here, which is a which is a backplane bus and there, there are several I O buses for example, uh, this ATA for disk drives, USB for variety of devices and so on, LAN. Okay. Uh, in in uh, loser terms sometimes some people call this as a north bridge and this as south bridge, right? just because of the way they are typically placed in the diagram. So, uh, you, you would notice uh, uh, in some cases the frequencies are also given. Uh, th this is a bus which is connecting uh, the hub here and the processor and it would typically run at 533 or 800 megahertz, right. This is called the front side bus and uh, this is designed to connect to memory modules which will run at uh, 333 megahertz or 400 megahertz or 533 megahertz. Uh, okay, so, so uh, I think rest of these, uh, this is USB, SATA, ATA, these, these are basically disk drive uh, interfaces, uh, this is audio interface this is SIO which is another kind of serial IO, PCI, PCI express it is again another derivative of PCI and this is LAN. So, now in which way is this different from the diagram we had drawn earlier. Uh, here we have what you would have noticed is that we have hubs rather than adapters, we, we talked of adapters trying to connect two different types of buses, but hubs are somewhat more complex they are connecting multiple buses. Okay. Uh, and uh, device high speed devices like graphic display are connecting directly to memory hub and not to the I O hub. So, so this, this is a, here we uh, uh, had an impression that all the I O devices uh, are connecting are coming through I O bus to the back plane bus and then to the memory, memory processor bus. But here, uh, particularly, these uh, display devices are, are not connected to I/O control hub. They are connected to the memory hub. The, the the reason for this is that 
uh, the uh, the transfer demand the bandwidth demand here is extremely high as, as compared to all these this is the highest if you recall uh, uh, the first lecture on io we looked at a variety of peripherals and try to see get a feel of the speeds or the throughput requirement of various devices and we notice that the the display has the highest throughput requirement and therefore uh, this connects directly here then uh, uh, we talked of a processor memory bus here but actually speaking although it didn't show up in this diagram there are uh, two buses one is called front side bus and other is called uh, back side bus front side bus is the one which connects the main memory okay uh, through the memory control hub and there is also a back side bus which connects l2 cache which is a faster bus right uh, and uh, th that's not accessible outside on the motherboard it's uh, within the processor because uh, l2 cache here is on the chip itself so uh, there, there are uh, numerous varieties which are possible when it comes down to uh, real system although conceptually we have seen two three different possibilities there are uh, lots of variation which are possible okay uh, i have been mentioning the term standard bus uh, what what actually why we need standard and what these standards are uh, standardization is required so that uh, sub system from different manufacturers could talk to each other uh, if if that is not the if that were not the case if there were no standard buses uh, we would expect entire system to be built by one manufacturer so that uh, compatibility is ensured but once you de define a standard it's a common interface so uh, one company can build a processor one can build memory one can build different uh, io peripherals so uh, you you can get uh, one each single company may not necessarily specialize in all the areas and therefore uh, it's a better situation uh, that you you can allow multiple parties to build different things in which they are good at um, now, uh, but a, as technology develops, uh, the, these uh, speeds change and uh, various requirements uh, change. On the other hand, when you say uh, something has been standardized, you, you are freezing all the specification. So, so these are two contradictory requirements. Uh, on one hand, you you want things to improve. Uh, for example, when you are saying that you have defined a bus with 200 megahertz so so you you are freezing uh, everything at that you are saying that uh, if if i make one device it should be compatible with 200 megahertz you make you also make it compatible with 200 megahertz and we have sort of agreed and frozen it at that but uh, suppose i i make my devices better and i would like to run it at 300 megahertz you also want to run it uh, maybe 350 megahertz so uh, by standardizing you are sort of freezing and uh, arresting the growth whereas the technology will like to and and commercial pressure will like to push it in the other direction so what you need to do is you need to keep on revising and refining your standards okay so you you have a standard which is version 1 then you get version 2 which is where some of the things get re redefined all the performance specs go up a and this process has to be a, a continuous process uh, so you you have to have uh, formal mechanisms of uh, defining these standards and typically these are done by uh, either groups of industries which are formed industries and other bodies could also be there so you have consortiums formed which take the responsibility of collectively defining standards or you have professional bodies such as ieee or uh, icu and so on itu uh, they they have uh, again representation from various uh, organizations and they define the standard uh, in a manner which are acceptable to larger uh, community sometimes what happens is that uh, a proprietary interface or proprietary uh, uh, mechanism which becomes very popular gets adopted as a standard so others see benefit in uh, uh, following what what uh, a popular person is doing now what exactly standard standard as far as buses are concerned uh, is defined at various levels at physical level at electrical level 
and at the logical level. At physical level, you need to define exactly the shape, size, dimension of the connectors okay, uh, or the cables. At electrical level, you need to define uh, the voltage and current levels, the impedances and at logical level, you need to define the meaning of each signal and the sequence in which signals change and the events take place. So, uh, a bus standard is a, is a complex definition spanning from physical level to the logical level. Uh, Let us look at a few examples of uh, various kinds of buses. So, in, uh, in PC domain, uh, in, in early stages we used to have ISA bus which is which stands for industry standard architecture. Uh, so, so, that later on got extended to EISA or extended ISA bus. Then uh, further down the line, uh, now ISA and EISA uh, uh, were trying to connect everything, okay. but then later on it was felt that uh, processor memory could be connected through a faster link and peripherals need to be connected on a slower link. So, uh, VLB or uh, VESA local bus. VS stands for Video Electronic Standard Association, a local bus was defined and uh, ISA or EISA could get uh, linked to this. Then subsequently uh, PCI bus was defined stands for Peripheral Component Interconnect Bus, it is a backplane bus uh, and uh, this also has several has seen several revisions, I will uh, come, come to this in a moment and AGP stands for Accelerated Graphics Port. Uh, on which the display devices get connected. So, here is a comparison of some of these buses which I just mentioned. Uh, ISA bus was earlier 8 bit, later on became 16 bit, EISA is 32 bits, VLB and PCI also 32 bit, but later versions of PCI are 64 bits and uh, AGP is a 32 bit bus. The, the frequency uh, for uh, ISA and EISA it is 8.3 megahertz, VLB and PCI 33 megahertz, later versions of PCI uh, 66, AGP has gone from 66 to double of that and quadruple of that and even uh, AGP 8x is uh, also there on the scene. So, uh, depending upon the frequency and the width. Uh, the, the throughput is given in megabytes per second. So, here uh, 1 megabyte is uh, meant to represent 2 raised to power 20 and not 10 raised to power 6. Okay. So, that is why you will see some, some discrepancy, but approximately uh, uh, you can get this figure by uh, combining this and this. So, now PCA let us spend uh, a uh, couple of minutes on PCI bus, which is uh, invariably there in all the PC system now. The basic PCI was uh, a 33 megahertz synchronous bus, width was 32 bits and accordingly uh, peak transfer rate is 133 megabytes per second. So, this is a peak transfer rate that means, if the bus is continuously transferring data, it could transfer at that rate, but actually uh, because of uh, protocol delays and uh, idle times the transfer rate would be much less. The address which flows on this is 32 bits, uh, which can address 4 gigabytes of memory. In terms of voltage, it is it could have 3.3 volt or 5 volt, the two variations are possible. Uh, then later development on PCI bus led to uh, PCI version 2.2, which is 64 bit wide, 66 megahertz okay. And uh, therefore, uh, the overall performance is roughly four times. Both, both these factors get doubled. Then there is a PCI X version also, uh, which is uh, having a data rate of uh, uh, 133 megahertz. So bandwidth is uh, twice that, right? And uh, it has a 266 version, 266 megahertz, and bandwidth is. Uh, more than 2 gigabytes per second. There are other variations like mini PCI or compact PCI and uh, there is also serial version PCI express. Okay, it is a serial bus which uh, follows the signaling 
like PCI. We are not going into details of uh, what signals are there. It's it's a uh, that itself will take several hours if we have to go through that in detail. Uh, but but that's just a serial version. Serial buses are typically uh, cheaper because they have to carry very few wires, all right. And uh, therefore, the cables are cheaper, the connectors are cheaper, and on the whole, cost is lower. But obviously, uh, if you're sending one bit at a time, the total data rate gets reduced. So, uh, here is a comparison of some of I/O buses. Uh, you have serial port, okay, uh, on which sometimes you connect uh, external modems. Uh, parallel port on which you typically connect printer. Okay, this is a, some extended parallel port. USB on which uh, I have connected uh, this uh, flash memory device. You can connect devices like cameras, printers, scanners, and so on. Uh, then there are uh, other high performance serial serial ports like uh, FireWire and Fiber Channel. Uh, you can see that there is a wide range in terms of throughput rate. Uh, starting from uh, a fraction of megabytes per second going all the way up to uh, something like 400 megabytes per second. Then these are some of the IO buses to which disk, disk drives, uh, CD-ROM drives, DVDs they connect. So, ID is a very old one, Ultra ID, uh, SCSI which stands for small computer system interface. Uh, it has again you can see how the standards have evolved from SCSI 1 to 2 to 3, they are ultra wide fast you know all these uh, prefixes keep on getting added and the standards improve. So, starting with the 5 megabytes per second all the way up to 160 megabyte per second. So, so there are various uh, steps in between. Uh, so, so this is not all. Uh, these are only some of the standard buses uh, which we have seen. Uh, I'll close at this point. And in summary, what we have seen today is uh, we had seen the factors which influence performance of a bus. In particular, in detail, we saw how a variation of block size uh, would uh, uh, would change the performance. We saw it quantitatively. We uh, looked at different methods of arbitration of bus when there are multiple masters trying to get hold of the bus and uh, the requirement there is that it should be uh, a mechanism which can support priorities, uh, but at the same time should not lead to starvation, there should be a fairness. We uh, looked at the organization of buses within PCs and uh, uh, we, we uh, very uh, briefly looked at some examples of the buses at the backplane level and at IO level. Uh, within IO we saw uh, a series of buses which are for hard disk drive or uh, uh, CD-ROM drive or DVDs and we have seen that as uh, time progresses the buses have to be uh, refined and redefined the standards have to keep on changing to uh, keep pace with the technology. Thank you.